The um, you're probably talking about Mark, are you? Yeah. I yeah. Yeah. Um, all the all the said is Mark. Mark is the earliest gospel, and it's very, very, very simple, right? You don't have the earthquakes and the zombies climbing out of the grave. You don't have the eclipse of the sun. You don't have any of those things. You just have the women going to the tombs. They apparently, according to another version, they had already brought spices, but they were coming to bring spice to see it. And there, it, there was just, what they came to this tomb that they thought was the tomb where Jesus was temporarily buried. And by the way, uh, one naturalistic hypothesis is that Joseph of Arimathea allowed his tomb to be used as a temporary before he was finally buried. Uh, then so the body could have been moved, or they might have got the wrong tomb, we don't know. But there was a young man dressed in white sitting there. And notice that in Mark, notice that in Mark, you don't have any belief in the resurrection. You don't have any post-resurrection appearances. You have these women running away and neither said they anything to anybody because they were afraid. Mark ends his gospel right there. They didn't say a thing to anybody. And yet other gospels say, of course they did say things to other people. So if we take the earliest gospel at face value, we don't have an actual resurrected Jesus. We have, uh, we have a question. We have the women coming to a tomb and finding a man dressed in white in it, which might have been an angel. But uh, we actually don't have um, the empty tomb of Jesus or a post-resurrection appearance. That's later. Uh, Matthew and then Luke, who, by the way, contradict in many of the details of when it happened. When, when, Matthew, when Ma Matthew says when the women got there, the tomb hadn't been moved yet. And so then there was this big earthquake, and then the tomb was moved in their presence. But the other Gospels say that when the women got there, the tomb had already been moved. And then the angel sat on top of the stone instead of inside. A lot of these discrepancies lower the credibility or the reliability of these writers. Um, and if you're impressed that the crucifixion stories agree with each other, and you're not going to accuse them of collusion for their agreement in that, then you should be uh, equally Im impressed that the resurrection stories don't agree with each other. Because if they did, you would say they were guilty of collusion, and there's differences of opinion in there. So, uh, look at Mark as a very simple telling of a story that really does not have a bodily resurrected Jesus in it at all. Everybody knows that those last, uh, how many verses? 16 verses were added later that have the snake handling and all that stuff. They, those things were added by someone else later. Another evidence, by the way, that some kind of an early Christian was, again, tampering or trying to correct the documents uh, this were supposedly inspired by God. Thank you, Dan. And, yep, you want to ask yourself? May I jump in on what Dan's just been saying? Yeah. At this stage? Thank you. <laughs> you 30 seconds. Thank no, you. don't bother. <laughs> 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 approximately, yeah. a yeah. Yeah. approximately a minute. Approximately a minute. I think that there are a number of things that we can say about Mark's report. What is very clear is that Mark's Gospel ends quite deliberately on a crashing anticlimax. And the women went to the tomb and found nothing, and heard a message which they didn't understand, and they ran away afraid, and they told nobody. And what happened? Now I think it's very clear that Mark is doing that deliberately. He is provoking you to ask, what happened? I don't think it's because he doesn't think there was a resurrection. I think it's precisely because he wants his audience to think about the fact that there was. Can I just ask you, do you think it's possible that uh, there was a, a longer ending to Mark and that that got replaced? <coughs> Some scholars have suggested that that really was the ending, but somebody goofed and pasted in the wrong ending. Well, I don't think I have an expert opinion on okay. that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So another question for Chris. Hi, um, Dan suggested in his uh, concluding remarks that um, other historical writers don't have an agenda the way John uh, explicitly says he did. And we seem to infer, I think, that he um, discredits John's testimony because of that. Uh, is that, as a historian, is that the case? That people with, uh, that historians never have agendas and that those that do are discreditable? I didn't discredit it. I lowered its reliability. <laughs> <laughs> I'll comment on that as well. I, I don't think Dan was making it quite that black and white either. Uh, I think all writers have agendas. All of them without exception. The task of a critical historian is to try and formulate an hypothesis that takes that into account and that then comes up with a reasonable explanation not only for the events that are being described but also for the reason that they're being described the way they are. In other words, you've got to come up with a hypothesis
tells us that builds in the biases, implicit or explicit. For me, I'm quite happy that John has his biases explicit. Matthew, Mark and Luke have them too, they're just not explicit. But every historian, every writer has their own agenda, and that's what typical history is about dealing with. tried to win people over to his point of view in a written form. Uh, today, you've been trying to win people over in a verbal form. If John's factual information is suspect because he's trying to win people over, should we similarly doubt your uh, factual efforts to be true? Yes, you should. You should doubt everything I say and not take my word for it. You should question it all. You should assume that I am wrong and go study it for yourself. Well, the point about John was to compare them with Justin Martin, who Chris said was not really a historian when he was writing, but then neither was John a historian. He was, if, if anything, he was a friend of somebody who knew an early Christian. Because John, when he wrote that in the mid-90s, how old would he have been? Almost 100 years old, right? There's actually a question about... Sorry? There's actually a question about when John wrote the Gospel. All the ancient sources agree that John lived to a great age. But J.A.T. Robinson pointed out that none of the sources actually say he wrote the Gospel at a very great age. He may have written it earlier, but then lived to a very great age. So I'm not sure that the date of the Gospel is absolutely to be pinned in the 90s. Yeah, okay, I know, that's all flexible there, but... Think about this. We often hear from Christians that one of the evidence is for the truth of Christianity is that the disciples all died these horrible deaths as martyrs. Why would they die for a lie? But then if they all died these horrible deaths as martyrs and lived in first century Rome where the life expectancy was about 45 years old, how in the world did Matthew and Luke and John live long enough to have written those Gospels? Obviously they were written by somebody who were not eyewitnesses. They were, if they were all martyrs, they were... Whoever wrote the book of John must have been a second or third generation. In fact, Burton Mack suggests that Mark was from a second generation of Christians, that he didn't really know any of the real players, but that he was like the child of early Christians, and he was writing it kind of from a second degree. So all of those Gospels are secondhand, at least, or, or even thirdhand testimony. And uh, I'm not saying we should discount John just because of that, but I think the fact that he admits that he has a religious agenda to what he's writing, if, if any other person admits that they're writing history with a religious agenda, you're going to drop their reliability a little bit. I don't know by how much, but you're going to question their motives in their writings. Not if other people have questions. So let, let the audience have their go. Um, I'd just like to talk about the fact that um, Dan is saying that you know it might have been second generation or third generation people that are not um, eyewitnesses, but doesn't I always understood that in the first century and in the um, period before Christ that oral tradition was actually a very strong thing and the Jews were very strong in their oral, tradi uh, oral traditions and that they were very accurate and that this has been borne out by the fact that that um, that not, you know, not the people in those days were not actually literate so the way that they actually um, Got, got information out was through oral tradition and, and I understand that if you look at things like the Dead Sea Scrolls, the, the, what they've written in Azar is very similar to what was written for a long time ago, so the oral well, traditions are very strong. There, uh, there are three things to be said there. Uh, number one, the Dead Sea Scrolls are very useful checks on the text of the Old Testament, but they're not oral tradition, they're written material. The first thing to say is that I think Burton Mack is not the only person who thinks Mark is second generation. Papias, the early Christian writer quoted by Eusebius, says that as well, explicitly. He says Mark was not a disciple of the Lord, he was later a disciple of Peter. So I think Mack is on good ground there, though not necessarily on quite a number of other things. Um, so yes, the writers are probably second or possibly even third generation. But to pick up on the second part of your question, yes, oral tradition was an important part, not just of the Jewish culture, but of all cultures in the ancient world. Because even where the educated elite were literate, they actually preferred the oral tradition. Even Cicero, 
who wrote voluminously, actually preferred using the oral material. Literature in the ancient world was predominantly the written form of oral material, and the oral material was primary. Now, I'm not claiming that oral material is necessarily reliable, but I am claiming that it is considerably more reliable in a culture that depends regularly and heavily on memory than it is in our culture, where I can't even get by without a word process. <laughs> thank you very much. I'd like to thank both speakers for their answers to your questions.